Our next speaker is Stuart Turner, who was a computer science undergraduate before he started to lose control of his body. He's now a quadriplegic and he's created a voice activated system that enables him to code hands free. So he's going to be talking about the ultimate smart home. Sorry I couldn't be there in person. I've been slayed this year by a pressure sore and I'm stuck in a lot. But how great is it that I can be here though, all the way from Todmorden? All hail telepresence, I say. Anyway, I'm Stuart Turner and I mostly do work with autonomous drones. I work on interface development and software testing for quadriplegic accessibility. Um, I've helped test the last few versions of Apple's iOS, for instance. It seems I have this natural talent for the work. Look, my no hands. <laughs> but today I've come to talk to you about smart homes. Because I was with NHS, Calderdale Accessible Homes, and Brocklin Designs in Todmorden. I built one, and it's brilliant. A few months ago, it was even featured in the Sunday Times Homes and Gardens. How fancy is that? <laughs> Now, let's be clear. My smart home is smart for me. I don't think everyone should have one exactly like mine. But I do think that the design principles we use can be applied by everyone to build their own smart home. So let me just tell you a quick story about some assistive technology that was applied to me and how that experience helped me to develop this approach. Um, so a few years ago, I was referred into this mysterious system called NHS Assistive Technology. I had to steer an application through panels convened to approve funding. And we're talking thousands of pounds here. Now, I didn't know what I was applying for, just vague equipment that was built to help me. And the only thing I knew was that I really needed help. So I filled in the forms and sat through the meetings. And some 22 months later, two years of my life, an engineer arrived to fit the technology. It was called the Control Prop. It was a big, clunky box with a massive red plastic button attached. It seriously looked like a prop from Blake 7 or some 70s sci-fi. The engineer sat in my bedroom with his back to me and programmed in my allotted functions. With the remote plugs, I was told, I would be allowed to turn on a fan, turn on a lamp, and with a landline hookup, I could make three phone calls to my mum, my father-in-law, and 999. But it turned out that he'd programmed one of the numbers wrong. So actually, I could call 999, my father-in-law, and a ladies college in Oldham. <laughs> We're actually pretty good friends. I'm thinking of writing a rom-com script about it, but um, no. Um, anyway, <laughs> there was one other issue. Because of my limited mobility, I can only press one button at a time, and I was already using a button to control my laptop. I'd rigged up this whole system over years as I lost function. I can't move my button, my hand to a second button independently. So, and nobody told me this, in order to use this control prog to turn on the lamp or call the ladies college, I would have to give up my computer. They wanted me to lie there all day, finger at the ready, the sunset so I could turn on my own lamp. I'm a computer scientist, so I think I might have needed my computer. So when I said to them, maybe this wasn't a great use of my life, they were completely bewildered. So I got on with it myself. I got a few ancient cables and coded up a software bridge so I could trigger the thing from my laptop. Although I probably shouldn't say this because when I contacted the company, they expressly forbade me to do it, so I, I can't release the software I built to help anyone else. It's proprietary. Ironically, it's not accessible. The accessibility product is not in itself accessible. I couldn't fix the wrong phone number because the technology was a black box. I wasn't supposed to make any changes to the device. I didn't own it, it wasn't mine, and it wasn't, frankly, useful to me at all. It often seems like a lot of the very well-meant time and energy and money is spent in a kind of accessibility theatre, with tech as props placed around me for effects. Now, this pattern was repeated over and over and over, but 
the control prog sticks in my mind because on the same day this fabled device was installed at great cost and somewhat Herculean effort, the government sent out thousands and thousands of plugs that could be turned on and off with any remote control. They dropped through our letterbox on the very same day for free as an energy saving initiative. You can even buy them in pound shops. Excuse me. With the control prog, I could call three numbers at a cost of 1,200 quid. For 500 quid, I could buy an iPhone and call anyone in the world, anywhere. Disability technology is very often disabled technology. But you can see why, when I got control of my own NHS budget and I began to build my accessible smart home, I set out a few general principles for purchases. 1. To use low-cost, commercial, off-the-shelf electronics. 2. Open source products where possible, with a focus on looking for dev kits and APIs. 3. Open design. Products that integrate with other technology and other brands, so I don't get locked into somebody's walled garden. And number four, don't be too dogmatic. Disability products can be necessary for that last mile. So let's go into a little bit more detail about this. Number one, low cost commercial off the shelf electronics. This is as much about pragmatism as it is ideology. We all know that funding for disabled people is unreliable and unpredictable. I have a great setup now with CHC, but I could lose that at any time and be left totally on my own again. I can't count on support. No disabled person can. I don't want to be left with equipment that I can't afford to repair or replace. So I have to build the most robust system I can now. And robust means expecting that parts will fail and needs will change. Products developed in an open market turn out to be cheaper, better, and do more than those developed in the doldrums of disability land. And there are just more products, more different types of things. So it's easier to construct this specialised, custom solutions that profound disability like mine requires. Disability products tend to be low-tech, single-use, unconnectable, and very expensive. The VAT saving is a red herring. We always try to find mainstream products and avoid that disability markup. Sometimes this is actually the same product. For example, a gooseneck clamp sold by a leading disability supplier for £72 as a wheelchair mount is on Amazon for £16.99. As a camera mount, it's the exact same product. Dig a little deeper and you'll find a generic gooseneck that can do the same job for two quid. I have tons of examples of these things. It happens all the time. The best thing to do is look for situations where able-bodied people would be without the use of their hands and you will find a wealth of cheap assistive tech. Extreme sports and driving are some examples. In-car holders for phones are a few quid compared to hundreds of pounds if they're marketed as wheelchair attachments. My partner just made me a coffee cup holder for my chin controller, this thing you can see here, uh, by wrapping a BMX grip tape around the gantry and clipping on a Buckman clamp, which is just a kind of hipster coffee cup holder for your bike, and putting in a keep cup, which is just another reusable latte cup. It's all cheap and easily available in bike shops or Amazon or wherever. Another thing to think of is things like buying mountaineering jackets for coats. They have articulated arms for climbing postures, so when climbers have got their arms above their heads, so they're much easier to put on if you have to be dressed by another person. So thinking back to those energy-saving remote control plugs, they weren't sold as disability technology. They were just labour-saving devices. Things that make manual jobs easier for everyone. We're actually quite good at inventing tools and tech that save steps and work and make our lives easier. It's almost like the idea of disability technology is a kind of block that impedes our thinking. Number two, open source. Going back to the control prog again, I'm just going to talk in a little bit of detail about one smart product that I have that is really common. My light bulbs. 
There are lots of smart bulbs on the market now, but I went with LifeX because they are open source and hackable. They don't need an engineer to fit them. They don't even need a hub like the Philips Hue. You just screw them into your light fitting like any other bulb and they join your normal Wi-Fi network. When I got them, I got them from Kickstarter, they were pretty rudimentary. The first app was fixed sideways on my iPad and obviously I can't hold the iPad to turn it round, so I couldn't use the app. But, you know what, it's okay that they didn't think about me. Because these light bulbs are also scriptable, they left, they released dev kits in an API. They left that door open just a crack. So I can write some JavaScript to look, turn the lights on when the sun goes down. Or I can get that data, sunset in my location, freely from the weather channel on a web service called If This Then That and hook the lights up that way. When you lower the barriers, even by just a little, you allow people to solve their own problems. That's how the light gets in. A couple of years later, and there are dozens of apps for these lights. These lights wake me up in the morning with a sunrise program. They start my melatonin production off in the evening with a long red sunset. And in the night, when I have to get up every couple of hours, they stay red so I don't wake up too much. They flash different colours when I need to take different medications, or they remind us to take the recycling out on a Friday. I could hook them up to my phone's location data so that when I left the house the lights turn off. There are thousands of recipes online that I could add to my system and I can make my own up too. Thinking about that control prog and that software bridge with an open system like LifeX I could have shared my solution with anyone that needed it for free. Okay so obviously I'm a geek and not everyone can do these things themselves. They need support from experts. But these experts should be experts in adaptation, in hackability, not in going to disability fairs and only buying these high-cost, low-competition niche products. And they should always look for products that can be modified and the mods shared with other people. We need to be allowed to collaborate. Otherwise, every disabled has to start from zero every single time. Living with quadriplegia is already an escapology trick. You start in a room with your arms and legs tied to a bed. When you call for help, you're given a paper form to fill in. How do you get out? This is like dropping each 18-year-old in a cave and asking them to build their own house, road, car, and even invent their own job before they start work the next morning. Number three, this is all part of open design. Normal people won't buy a telly that can't be plugged into their skybox. They won't buy a car that can't be used in the rain. Mainstream companies that try this stuff go bust. Even though disability companies do this sort of thing all the time. So I try not to get locked into one brand of product or one way of doing things. My smart bulbs are Wemo and my smart bulbs are LifeX. My smoke alarms are Nest and my heating system is by Heatmiser. The only thing they all have in common is that they all have ways to connect to other things in this vast internet of things. They are hookable and hackable. If one of these companies goes bust, my whole house won't go out of order overnight. If the light bulbs break down, it will be dark, but I won't also freeze to death. It's important to note as well that a lot of this is really a lot cheaper. I mean, seriously. I was quoted around £10,000 to have a Control 4 lighting system in my new house. I spent the £600 on mine. Designing openly isn't just about making sure that everything works together. It's about leaving a space for things to change. It's about being adaptable. It's about wiggle room. Adaptable is accessible because you can change things to make them work for you. I could only get funding to automate one door, my front door. So if someone shuts my office door without thinking, I can't go to work until they come back, which is not always a bad thing, but... Um, but because we left the design open to being automated, we put in sliding doors and ran electrics to them when we did the wiring. When I can get the cash, this will be a very simple problem to solve. I used to have a normal desk for my computer, and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to get the wheelchair under the desk and how so I could see the screen. But 
it eventually occurred to me that I don't need a desk at all. I don't use a keyboard. So now I use Ergotron mounts that are articulated. I can reposition them over and over so I can see them whatever position my wheelchair happens to be in. I can work lying down if I need to, and sometimes I really do need to. I couldn't do that under a desk. Thinking about that desk that I couldn't fit under, I think it's easier, some, easy sometimes to get stuck solving the wrong problem. Does it matter that I can't do things in the usual way? No, I don't think so. I think that confuses the method with the goal, confuses the way you do things with what it is you want to accomplish. A lot of adaptations are about pushing the button, about conceptually replacing the hands I can't use. Excuse me. But you know that saying when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail? Well, hands are turning good at turning knobs, dials, light switches. All tools are made for hands but they aren't necessary for triggering the processes that I need. I don't actually need to access the light switch. I can hook the light bulb up to the sunset and it can just sort itself out when it gets dark. Number four, pragmatism versus dogmatism. The key to all of this is pragmatism. I can't emphasize how important pragmatism is because I'm disabled now in this world. I can't wait until we've fixed everything. I have to run two tracks, the long game of ideals, of changing minds and behaviours and eventually changing the world, and the reality of dealing with what may be a brief life filled with some pretty big challenges. I can't wait around for everything to be perfect. I've got to design for the world that is now and not to be too depressing. I've got to expect it to get worse. That's the reality of a degenerative illness, so I need to be flexible. I need to be able to rapidly revise my systems. I can't sit around for two years applying to be able to call 999 and the ladies' college. So the other reality is that, you know, other people aren't perfect either. Changing behaviours is difficult and it takes time. In the past year, I've probably had 30 different care workers. It's just not practical to hope that every single one of them practices good infection control. Instead, it's pragmatic to design an environment where the easiest choice is always the right choice. So, we spent a lot of time on designing out tasks like cleaning, tidying and dusting. We refer to this great NHS website called NHS Spaces a lot, which unfortunately has disappeared now. There's too much really to cover in this talk, but just briefly, things like removing as many horizontal surfaces as possible. We don't have side tables or coffee tables or dado rails or cornicing even. There are no open shelves. Computers and books are in cabinets with doors, so dust can't collect anywhere but the floor, where it's easily hoovered and carers are forced to put everything away after they've used them, so everything stays organised and clean. There's nowhere to put anything down. The easiest thing to do is to clean up after yourself, so they do. We zoned areas so the clinical waste is next to the carer's stock cupboard. The hand towel is always on its own hook by the sink. The hand wash is always by the tap. We made sure every tap, handle, doorknob light and light switch was made of unlacquered brass from World of Brass and took the lacquer off with nail polish. Brass, as a copper alloy, is naturally bactericidal, so it's a really cheap infection control intervention, and it was a one-time cost. It never wears out. The walls are painted in Steracryl silver iron paint, and even the ceilings are boarded with green line, which is a type of plasterboard that absorbs volatile organic compounds. At every point in the build, Brocklin Designs considered if they could make a material do double duty. So the silicon sealant is antibacterial, the tile grouting is protein resistant. But more than this, they used floor to ceiling dolphin panels in the wet room, so there's almost no grout at all, and fewer grooves for mould to grow. Calderdale Accessible Homes, who issued the Disabled Facilities Grant and consulted throughout, were ambitious and open-minded enough to allow me and Brocklin Designs to actually implement these unconventional ideas 
for which I am forever grateful for. They really were amazing throughout all of this. One final part of pragmatism is also not getting locked into your own rules. I believe in low-cost, mainstream, open-source products, but I can't afford to be dogmatic about that either. You should never be dogmatic about your dogmatism, because every so often there's a product that you can't do without, and that isn't sold as a mainstream product because it objectively makes your user experience worse unless it's exactly the thing that you need. No one should swap out their wheelchair for a deck chair hacked with bicycle wheels. That would be rubbish. The last smile of connecting to mainstream technology often has to be a piece of disabled specific technology. I can control my laptop and write code and use APIs because I have the buddy button, a binary switch input that I can press with my five millimeters of conscious control in my right index finger. I could do without it, but I certainly don't wish to. Anyway, I'll leave you with this. We built this smart house on the principles of using interoperable, mainstream, cheap, hackable, flexible products that make life easier, not just for me, but for everyone. These principles ensure that I can live in an ecosystem where people and devices work together and that the easiest thing is the right thing to do. Good design has these principles anyway. People talk about interfaces being intuitive, design changing behaviour and directing flow. Good design shouldn't consider the disabled person as apart from everything and everyone else. It should be integrative of people, tools and technology. This is how technology can bring people back into the world. This is how technology has brought me here to you today. Thank you. Fantastic, Stuart. Fantastic. That was wonderful, Stuart. Thank you very much indeed. Um, are there any questions for Stuart? Stunned silence. No. You must have explained everything superbly, Stuart. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, there is a question at the back. Uh, Mark, have you got the uh, the microphone? Where's Mark gone? Oh, I'll wander over. We need the microphone for the recording, that's all. Yes, sir. And thank you very, very much for your presentation. Um, it, it's interesting how you describe um, the concept of pragmatism in like finding your way around open source, but also sometimes not fully open or things that actually aren't open, but that allow you to do this. And I know you're talking to us through an iOS device. And so uh, I was just yeah. wondering if in your experience you found um, other alternatives that are not iOS based and how they compare in, in your experience? Um, at the moment, iOS is a world leader for disability technology. There is nothing else that enables a disabled person, whether you're blind, deaf, or have motor skill problems like I do, um, that works as well. I've tried them all, and there is nothing like this. Um, hopefully they will catch up, but at the moment, iOS is just, is just amazing for it. And it's really simple to do as well. Another question um, over the other side of the room, Stuart. Just bear with me a minute. I'm walking as fast as I can here. <laughs> here we go. Yes, sir. Just to go back to your point about how you're a geek. Um, so, where do you, so a lot, as you say, a lot of this is available out there, and it's a matter of just putting it together. Like, where would your vision be for how people who lack your knowledge or or confidence, which is what a lot of it comes down to ultimately, to try and whack a few things together and understand that you won't break them, or if you do, then, you know, it's pretty cheap to, to fix whatever you do to it, unless it's an iPad or something. Um, but, uh, like, where would you, like, recommend that other people with disabilities start to think about their, their needs and putting stuff together? Um, well, we're going to be launching a website called inventability.net. And there's my blog as well, which is robotsandcake.org. Um, but I think the thing to think is what it is that you want to achieve. Um, 
and then look for mainstream products that can um, that can achieve those goals. But at the moment, there just isn't very much out there, which is why I'm giving talks and and trying to create these resources in collaboration with different people. Um, but yeah, I I spent a lot of time on Hacker News and just immersed in this stuff. Um, I think that's a really good point. People um, would need to be... Um, you need to know that the thing that you're going to try isn't going to break and take out your whole system and way of doing things. So at the moment, there isn't one good resource. Um, I'm desperately trying to think of something, but yeah, inventability.net will be online soon, and that's what the focus is going to be. It's going to be on. Thank you, Stuart. Another question here. I'm going to come up to you so you can see who I am. You're just talking to a face full of people. And this is probably to do with the question I'm going to ask, which is changing the attitude of people who aren't um, disabled and able bodied versus the technology. So you can empower yourself to look at technology and applications, but do you think that the cultural shift of people's awareness of disabilities is as important, or where would you put those two together? Um, yeah, I think that people need to, there needs to be a shift away from um, just providing technology to disabled people. Instead, it needs to be a more collegiate and collaborative process um, and there also needs to be an awareness that disabled people have something to contribute. We're not all, you know, scrounging scum that are single-handedly responsible for taking out the uh, economy, which I think, which is a lot of responsibility. I mean, 2008 was clearly my fault, but, you know. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, I think there needs to be a cultural shift in, in amongst able-bodied people but it's going to be a long slow process because I don't think people a lot of people can see what it is that I could possibly offer society and I think until that changes um, it's going to be slow going and that's certainly one of the one of the problems I come up against is a, a complete lack of expectation like when I went back to work there was a lot of confused faces like why why would you want to go back to work why do you go to work? You know, because I would be bored watching TV all day. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Fantastic. Thanks, Stuart. Any other questions for Stuart? Yeah, gentleman at the back. Uh, just a quick technical question. Uh, have you done any experiments with eye beacons since you're using the... Uh, Kind of Apple technology to get location information. Into sorry, can you sorry can you repeat that? The, the line dropped out a little bit. Um, have you done any experiments with eye beacons to try and uh, adapt the system depending upon where you are in the house? Because uh, that's uh, um, no. But if someone has a big bag of them for me to play with, that would be great. Um, <laughs> okay, because okay, they look like an interesting cheap technology and kind of could be fun to play with. Sorry, say that again. They look like a, an interesting, cheap technology that could be fun to play with. And how yeah, oh yeah, they've, they've got loads of. Um, you could use blind people could use them for navigation in their phone. You, there's loads of things you could do with them. They look really, um, they look really useful, but they're really new at the moment. Um, yeah, they look interesting. They look really interesting, but I'm not quite sure. I think we could. They could be used as, um, like, if I'm out and my wheelchair kind of breaks and falls over they could be used as a distress system or all sorts of things yeah they look really cool wonderful thanks very much indeed Stuart we really do appreciate your time in being with us this morning and wish you all the best big round no of problem. applause for Stuart yeah.